evening all, my name is Saeed Malami. Um, I'm the student director of the Mill series. Tonight we have with us Jacob Siegel. Jacob Siegel is the news and politics editor at Tablet Magazine. He co-hosts a, ma a podcast, Manifesto, with an exclamation mark, with the National Book Award winning no novelist Phil Cly. He has written for the New York Times, Political Vice, American Affairs, and other publications. Tonight he will be speaking on the changing face of anti-Semitism. Please join us in welcoming Jacob Siegel. Uh, thank you all very much for having me. Um, I know there's a change in venue, and I appreciate everybody uh, bearing with me and coming here on um, so Wednesday night. Wednesday <laughs> night. Um, I don't know what night is like the party night at college anymore, but <laughs> hopefully it's not Wednesday. So. Um, thank you for having me here. I especially want to thank uh, Brandon and Saeed for inviting me to participate in uh, what I think is really an incredible program and a program that's in the past hosted a number of people who I have great admiration for. Camille Paglia comes to mind immediately and I know there's some great speakers coming up. I believe Jonathan Haidt is this Friday. And then Matt Stoller is maybe next month, next week. Both are interesting. If you don't know Stoller, he um, has a very, uh, how shall I put it, a, a very unique and um, I think trenchant view of the need for antitrust regulation and uh, the regulation of the financial industry in this country that, um, you know, s sort of a left-wing position, sort of an old school kind of FDR uh, or even pre-FDR liberal Democrat position. But anyway, I would strongly encourage you to go check it out. Um, I think it's, it's important stuff and it's, it'll be important, especially over the next couple of decades in terms of the political life of this country. So uh, I'm very... Very pleased to be here. By show of hands, has anybody ever heard of uh, an academic named Norman Finkelstein? Okay. By coincidence, uh, Finkelstein, who's mostly known as a kind of uh, vehement critic of Israel, is also um, a Mills scholar, a J.S. Mills scholar. And uh, he taught a free class on Mills at the Brooklyn Public Library, which is where I used to go work in the daytime, and I said, you know, I disagree with uh, Finkelstein about a lot, but he's uh, no fool. So I went and took a class on Mills with Finkelstein, from which I learned a lot, not least of which uh, was just an admiration, I think, for the underlying ethic of the, the kind of Mills approach, which maybe has its limits, which could be discussed in another venue but has great strengths to recommend it also, not least of which is the idea that the way you get to the truth is through a kind of controlled conflict and that the controlled conflict in the realm of ideas, rhetoric, uh, is not only necessary to propel you forward to the truth uh, in the sense of, you know, a, a dialectic, if you will, or a, a kind of experimentation process that requires failure, it's also necessary to prevent actual conflict for which it's both a surrogate and a, a valve, a release valve. So that's Mills. Uh, now, for the question uh, tonight that I want to address, which is on the changing face of anti-Semitism, and the return of the Jewish question. I'll just very briefly say, before I actually launch into the talk, that what I hope to do tonight is both to sort of explain what I think is a, an emerging new social environment and a new social ecology. Uh, that I'm gonna focus on the United States, but I don't think it's limited to the United States. And what I mean by that, a social ecology is that I'm not just talking about a change in electoral politics. New politicians are getting elected. I'm not just talking about a change in uh, 
how parties are skewing that there's a, a demo, you know, the Democrats have a big progressive caucus now. The Republicans uh, seem to be leaning more towards a kind of populist, nationalist wing of the party. Those are symptoms of what I think is actually a larger change. And the larger change involves those things, but it also involves uh, what might be better described as you know, broad cultural attitudes. And those broad cultural attitudes and political uh, changes and the, this changes in terms of social relationships, all of those occur with a backdrop of massive technological and material change. So in these moments of great change, in these moments of material, political, social upheaval, and I'll, I'll mention the Industrial Revolution briefly in the course of the talk, what tends to happen is that we have spasms of violence directed at uh, minority groups, sometimes directed between two uh, dominant groups, uh, you know, majority groups, if you will, in the form of international conflict. Um, but in particular, in the societies in which these upheavals are occurring, uh, there's often a higher degree of what you might call political violence, politically motivated violence, ideological violence. And we're already seeing some of that in America. Uh, I don't think we're really seeing it yet. I think we're seeing what are sort of actually weird premonitions of what's going to be a more intense forms of conflict, more than likely. But, you know, these sort of set piece theatrical battles between Antifa and members of the alt right is like uh, sort of a dramatization of the conflict, maybe more than it is the conflict itself. I don't say all this uh, as a scare tactic. I don't counsel alarmism. I don't counsel <laughs> despair. Um, the world has been in much worse situations in the past. But I bring this up to say that I think the stakes are higher than usual. The stakes for all of you in this room are much higher than they were for me when I was your age. When I was uh, an adolescent, you know, in the 1990s, I just, I was like thinking about personal things and art and uh, how to, you know, enjoy myself in ways that felt interesting to me. Something like that, you know, find a girl who liked me, uh, like listen to music. I don't know. Uh, they felt important at the time, but that was a luxury. And uh, I don't know if I'm, I was better off, you're better off, but it's, it is different uh, now. And, you know, whether you want to call that the return of history or you have some other name for it, uh, I don't know. And I don't have any final prescriptions for anybody. Uh, I just think that these things matter more now. Ideas matter more. The stakes are higher. So whatever you take away tonight, whether you agree with me, you disagree with me, uh, feel I ought to be denounced, whatever the case may be, um, I think that the, uh, the engagement is worth it and that um, we need to try and seriously grapple with the ideas that I'm going to raise, even if I arrive at all the wrong conclusions. Okay that not so brief preamble out of the way. So I'm going to argue to you that the attitude a society exhibits towards its Jews tells you very little about that, very little about the Jews rather, and a great deal about the society. In his book, Anti-Semite and Jew, the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre pithily observes that if the Jew did not exist, the anti-Semite would have to invent him. That was almost right. While reality is faithful to the absurdity in Sartre's comment, it is more cruel because the Jews do exist, and yet the anti-Semites still invent them, piling their inventions on top of the heads and necks of real people. I'll give you one piece of evidence for this thesis that actual flesh and blood Jewish communities are, if not irrelevant, then often secondary to the societal attitudes towards Jewishness. 
So the, the prevalence of conspiracy theories about Jews in countries where there are no Jews, including countries like, for instance, Malaysia, where there have never been Jews in any significant number. Now, you might attribute this as a, a property of how myth and folklore spread. Jews as a diaspora people, since uh, uh, going into the diaspora after the destruction of the Second Temple, they've lived in many different countries, they've been around for a long time. So maybe the fact that there are these stories about Jews in countries where there are no Jews just reflects that, that fact that they've been spread around for a long time, and these are just sort of fables recounting, uh, you know, the past or embedded bits of folk wisdom and stories about these people, the Jews. The problem with that and the evidence that these theories are not just fables is that they actually try to explain the world. That is, they are theories of power that make claims about the true workings of the world we live in now not just allegorical stories about the past, not just allegories about ethics in a broad or abstract sense, but actual claims about power and the world as it exists. So, for instance, when Malaysia's Prime Minister, Mahathir Mohamed, engages in Holocaust revisionism, and claims that, quote, hooked nose Jews, quote, rule the world by proxy, and that he's, quote, glad to be labeled anti-Semitic, before, of course, turning around and complaining that he's being persecuted by Jewish censors for stating what is just an opinion. He's not engaging in idle speculation or venting what is a, a mere personal prejudice. No, it's actually something different. He's claiming to explain how the world actually works. And he's providing an answer, an answer that relies on the figure of these people, this conspiracy they're engaged in, the Jews, that answers fundamental questions or claims to answer fundamental questions about how people live, why certain people are in power and other people are disempowered why some people are rich and others are poor. That's what he claims to be answering. Now, the critical piece of context to keep in mind when Muhammad inveighs against this clannish Jewish force that rules the world from the shadows is that there are no Jews in Malaysia, nor have there ever been. So Jews and Jewishness have nothing whatsoever to do with the actual country Muhammad is in charge of governing or the actual problems impacting the actual Malaysians whose lives he's nominally charged with improving or at least leading. And I want to suggest to you that this intense obsession with the symbolism of Jews as a way to explain the hidden workings of the world is not only limited to fringe kooks and online Nazis with anime avatars, or the elected leaders of large countries in Asia. This phenomenon is also shaping American politics and social life to a degree that has not been the case since before the Second World War. You can find it on both the left and the right, among Democrats and Republicans, among Trumpists, and among members of the Democratic Socialists of America and members of countless other political factions, including all manner of anti-establishment conspiracy theorists, though none of these groups are exclusively made up of or defined by anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish conspiracy. You can find it online in chat rooms and in government offices and in churches and in mosques, as well as in university classrooms like this one and in activist organizations, and you know, anywhere else you can find Americans, essentially. And I don't mean to suggest, nor do I believe, uh, that America is in the, you know, the grip of, of uh, some prelude to, uh, you know, that this is a Weimar moment in terms of the treatment of American Jews, or that we're on the cusp of some catastrophe 
on the order of World War II. I don't think we're anywhere close to that. And I would not want to give the impression that we were. However, if you come back to where I started in that preamble about the stakes being higher, we are in a moment of real volatility and change. And the spike in anti-Semitism in America and the resurgence of Jews as symbolic agents or a unit of symbolism for a society in crisis to grapple with its own problems. That's what I'm talking about, and that is plenty dangerous enough, significant enough, on its own terms, without needing to be compared to the Second World War in a direct sense or any other historical period. Uh, we can just grapple with it for what it is. Now, the bad news is that no one is exempt from what I've described merely by virtue of the politics they claim. Not intersectional progressives, not social justice activists, not Marxists who reject identity politics altogether in favor of uh, dialectical materialism, purely materialist politics, not good liberal establishment types, not self-professed Republican patriots, no ideology is immune from this tendency. There is no foolproof inoculation that works forever, not even being born Jewish. This phenomenon of using Jews as esoteric symbols to explain the world, and especially to explain a moment of crisis in society, and of elevating a priori abstractions about Jewishness over the lives an historical record of actual Jews isn't just a sign of delusion or of error. It's a warning. It's a warning both to Jews whose lives are endangered by this tendency and to the society in which it takes place. I think, uh, you know, the shooting in Pittsburgh and in Poway is only, you know, two pieces of evidence, uh, but I think clearly illustrative of the danger that this tendency represents. So what this is, is it's a characteristic signal that's broadcast collectively, you know, in a kind of unconscious act or a, an act that combines elements of both deliberate conscious behavior and unconscious behavior. That act, that signal, right, is this filling up of symbolic portent into the figure of the Jews to explain what's going on in the world. A little later in the talk, we'll get into the historical precedent because this is a very, very old tradition uh, with a lot of precedent behind it. But it's representative of the breakdown in social order or an epochal change, a movement from one form of social and political organization to another. So the end of feudalism, for instance, something like that, the rise of nationalism, the rise of the nation state. These big societal changes tend to be accompanied by, especially in the European and to a somewhat lesser extent, the context of the Islamic world, tend to be accompanied by paroxysms of uh, hostility and symbolic interest in Jews. Now, how does this all apply in the world we live in right now to American politics in 2019 in the age of Trump? Let's start off by taking a bird's eye view. You know, what's it like to be uh, a Jew in America in 2019? And how does this thing, this anti-Semitism or this return of the Jewish question actually affect Jews and non-Jews, affect Americans? What does this actually look like? Well, you know, Jews have enjoyed not only the full legal protection of the federal civil rights structure in America for decades, they've also benefited from an informal, though perhaps equally powerful social and cultural consensus that shuns open anti-Jewish prejudice. This has been true more or less 
uh, sort of in its current form since the end of the Second World War. Right? You can't, in polite society, attack Jews as Jews. Right? Now, maybe you could find uh, examples of this, but they are uh, the exceptions that prove the rule. And the rule is that you will be shunned from the higher offices of society and from respectable society if you engage in this sort of open anti-Semitism, which attacks Jews qua Jews. Or you can't do that anymore. American Jews have one of the highest levels of educational attainment in America, the highest median incomes in America, by any measure are uh, you know, highly successful in socioeconomic terms. This is an achievement that's been true in the past also in other societies uh, and reflects a pattern that is sometimes called a, a market dominant minority group or a, Amy Chua has a, another term, uh, maybe a super minority I think is how she refers to it, which is a, a minor, minority group in a society that's uh, successful economically disproportionate to its status and so attracts kind of special attention to itself. Um, Chinese in, uh, I think, Indonesia are the example she uses. So this has been true uh, of Jews before. But unlike with these other kind of market-dominant minority groups, uh, where they're held back by these informal glass ceilings or informal standards. So yeah, you know, you could be a successful, let's say, at a Jewish law firm, but you can't get to the top of the, uh, you know, the, the old... WASP law firms, something like that, or you can't ascend to the highest levels of uh, cultural leadership that might have been true prior to the Second World War. That's really no longer true either. So all of which is to say that uh, across the range of kind of measurable socioeconomic and cultural indices, Jews are pre doing pretty well in American life in 2019. Uh, but if you were to just stop there, you'd be missing something uh, quite important, uh, missing a few things that are quite important. The first is the historical context I just brought up, which is that this isn't the first time uh, that this has been true. And it's also um, not necessarily determinative of what the future will hold. Things can change suddenly, right? But the other thing to keep in mind is that in addition to being one of the highest uh, achieving groups in education and by socioeconomic standards, Jews are also the leading victims of hate crimes in America. Right? So if we look at just the FBI stats for 2018, and you look at uh, what are called single bias hate crime incidents due to religion, 56.9% of victims of these crimes were motivated by anti-Jewish bias. That's almost 57% of all anti-religiously uh, you know, motivated hate crimes are targeting Jews. To get to the second most targeted group, which is Muslims, it's almost a 40-point drop-off. They are 14.6% uh, of victims. And the group after them, Sikhs, is at 4.3%. Now, in case you think that there's something anomalous about 2018, this has been true every year since 2001, right? So Jews are the essentially semi-permanent or perennial number one victim of hate crimes in America. And that includes both, uh, you know, incidents with the uh, synagogue being defaced and acts of violence. So they lump this stuff together. And I would tell you, you can find people who will pick apart these hate crime stats, sometimes for good reason. and. Uh, they can be, especially the ADL stats, for instance, um, there's reason to be skeptical and you should all go and do some research yourself if you're interested, but the trends in general don't lie, right? So while the numbers might be slightly off, the fact that Jews are the leading victims of hate crimes every year since 2001 and are uh, so far ahead, um, you know, that would be very hard to fudge statistically. Now, included in those stats are the really grotesque, violent incidents of the past year. The shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, which killed 11 people. The shooting at Poway six months later. 
where one person was killed and three were injured. And those types of attacks, the sort of characteristic of those attacks in America usually indicates a far right white nationalist or neo-Nazi attacker. That's sort of the tactic that they use. It's the same tactic that was used at the Christchurch massacre, uh, a massacre at a mosque targeting Muslims, but a similar tactic, guy trying to live stream the attack, went in and killed as many innocent defenseless Muslims as he could, which is the same thing that happened in Pittsburgh. And so the, the most violent sort of terrorist attacks in America over the past year have been far right people who are some sort of combination of old school white nationalist and the kind of new stew of far right tendencies that gets lumped in together under the alt right. And so some politicians and ideologues would like you to believe that all anti-Semitic violence in America is being committed by these white nationalists who are themselves uh, direct product of the election of Donald Trump as president. And I could provide for you a whole number of quotes that would back that up, that that's what people have argued and prominent people in political life in America have made this argument. I'll get to some quotes in a minute, but in fact, that's just not true, right? So if we look, instead of at the national level, if we look at New York, in February 2017, the New York Police Department reports an 81% increase in hate crimes compared to the same period in 2016. And that increase is largely driven by 115% increase in incidents targeting Jews. And it's clear that the majority of those attacks are committed by black and Hispanic assailants. It's clear because there are a number of video incidents. It's clear because if you drill down on the police department statistics, that's what you find. And yet, the highest levels of the political leadership in New York are unable to talk about this honestly. So New York's mayor, Bill de Blasio, who can be very honest when attacking white nationalist anti-Semitic violence, when he finds that there's violence targeting Jews committed by people of color, he becomes incapable of even acknowledging that this is occurring. So to give just one example, de Blasio in May 2019 says at a press conference, the forces of white supremacy have been unleashed. And as you know, those are profoundly anti-Semitic forces. True enough. Okay. The forces of white nationalism are profoundly anti-Semitic forces. Those two tendencies do go together. They are mutually reinforcing. Um, the problem with de Blasio saying this was that he was saying it in response to a question about an incident in which a Jewish woman was spit on by a visibly non-white assailant in Brooklyn, which was part of a string of attacks against religious Jews in Brooklyn. So you have the mayor of New York City responding to a question about a videotaped incident by invoking white supremacy. So unless you're willing to believe that there is no form of anti-Semitism that is not somehow a tributary of white supremacy, the only other conclusion to draw is that we have a highly politicized attitude towards what kind of anti-Semitism we can acknowledge and what kind we can't acknowledge. And what it boils down to is what is politically expedient. So whereas people on the right in America turn a blind eye to, you know, uh, numerous statements questioning Jews loyalty from the president of the United States, for instance, when Trump says that, uh, any Jew in America who's still a Democrat, he questions their loyalty and their sanity. I have the exact quote, if anybody's worried that I'm, I'm uh, not getting it exactly right. People on the right, including Jews on the right, tend to brush this off, that um, it's not actually anti-Semitic. When Ilhan Omar questions the loyalty of Jews, the same people on the right who were generally not disturbed by Trump doing it, have no problem at all seeing that when Ilhan Omar does it, it's anti-Semitic. So what you have is a, a kind of broad problem in America where the kind of political paradigm would suggest you or the uh, 
What ideologues would try to convince you is that the vector of anti-Semitism, okay, is the political tendency of their opponents. So that's the claim, right? De Blasio, who wants to be uh, America's progressive mayor, thought, you know, just ran a ridiculous campaign for the Democratic nomination. He never had any chance of winning. But leaving that aside for a moment, uh, de Blasio is emblematic of something, right? Um, and, you know, he wants to tell you that all anti-Semitic violence is related to Trump and related to white supremacy. You can find essentially the exact same examples on the right. In fact, it's, this is a, a distortion, something close to an inversion of the truth, because the truth is that it's not the, the vector of the attackers or the anti-Semites that follows a partisan line, right? It's the response to anti-Semitism that makes it into something partisan, turns it into a kind of political expedient. And that has two consequences that are important. The first consequence that's important is that it's very difficult to effectively diagnose and treat a problem you're lying about, right? This is fairly obvious. So the mayor of New York City, the president of the United States, uh, Congresswoman Omar, uh, you know, if we can't talk about any of these things honestly, or if the people who feel connected to these political and public figures can't talk about these things honestly, how can we possibly do anything about it? That's one obvious consequence. But the other consequence is what I spoke about earlier. And that is, we're looking at signals about a broader social crisis that is manifested in a whole number of different ways, right? You could say the argument has been made uh, that the, the president of the United States, the current president of the United States, was elected in part as a symptom of that crisis. Now, that's not actually a, a sort of value statement one way or the other about Trump. But on, in a very obvious sense, the political energy behind his election, which has a parallel in the political energy behind the, you know, the sort of swell of support for the uh, left wing of the Democratic Party in the form of Bernie Sanders and now to some extent Elizabeth Warren. These are rejections of a what is thought of with a high degree of justification, in my opinion, as a corrupt social order. Right. We had a, I'll tell you, I'm uh, a veteran of the Iraq war and of the war in Afghanistan. And I look back at the last 20 years of foreign policy, and it seems to me like a form of unbelievable madness and uh, suggests to me a breakdown of the legitimacy or a breakdown of the, the capacity of leadership of the American elite, which then calls into question their legitimacy. I feel the same way to some extent about the financial crisis. I bring this up not to make this about myself, but to say that there are all these different symptoms, uh, different vectors through which to understand this crisis of the social order. However you approach it, it hasn't been resolved. It's ongoing. You know, if you believe what Andrew Yang is saying, for instance, we're, we're just at the cusp of the kind of breakdown and anarchy we can expect when the real wave of automation hits. Now, I happen to think that probably some of Yang's claims about how many jobs we're going to lose are exaggerated. But if he's one-tenth on the money, if he's one-tenth on the money, it could get very bad if we don't make some changes in the near term. And this hyper-focus on Jews and on Jewishness is not just or even primarily about Jews. It is also about this society in a moment of crisis trying to come to terms with that crisis. This way of coming to terms with the crisis through the figure of Jews as symbolic intermediaries is something that we should be able to condemn unequivocally 
we should recognize for what it is. And unfortunately, uh, I don't think either of those things have happened, in part because there is a competing impulse, and the competing impulse that prevents us from dealing with, the, with these things honestly is a primary loyalty or a primary instinctive attachment to kind of first order political or cultural affiliation instead of the truth in some broader sense or the, the good, the public good in some broader sense. I don't blame anybody for that. Uh, I, all, you know, all my loyalties are first order. Um, this is how we all function. We're wired to function that way. And it's only, you know, as Mills would have argued, it's only through conscious intellectual exercise through these forms of kind of controlled conflict that we're able to break apart our own biases and get a little bit closer to the truth. So I've eaten up a lot of time already. Um, let me quickly tell you, I'll give you one other example of a kind of high profile uh, thing that I was personally involved in. And that was um, if any of you are familiar with the Women's March, so the leadership of the Women's March um, was essentially sort of espousing like Nation of Islam rhetoric about uh, sort of derived from a, a book called The Secret uh, Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, which is a sort of updated version of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which claims without any historical basis at all that Jews were leaders of the slave trade. And this is something that's been repeatedly debunked um, and is really a, a, it's a pure sort of conspiracy theory. So is it so crazy? Is it so consequential that there are people in America who believe in conspiracy theories? No, it's not. What's consequential is that the leaders of the Women's March were openly espousing these positions we're openly socializing with, uh, or excuse me, openly endorsing the leadership of the Nation of Islam, um, using security from the Nation of Islam, while the leader of the group, Louis Farrakhan, is making, I mean, just the most luridly anti-gay, anti-Jewish, uh, misogynistic comments. And this causes a sort of minor controversy that goes on for about a year. And in the midst of that controversy, it doesn't stop the leaders of the Women's March from getting the endorsement of Kirsten Gillibrand, right? Uh, ran for president as a fairly high profile American politician, being put on a Vogue Women, uh, Women of the Year, getting a cover up. My point is that these Fringe conspiracy theories, which are then amplified by people placed in positions of real power and in institutions of real power, then get the imprimatur of the actual political establishment in the country. And how and why that works is something that I wrote a long article about that you can go, excuse me, look up if you're interested. But the point to make is that We, we hear a lot these days about, uh, and I think this is a good thing that people have come to understand that, for instance, systemic racism is different than uh, the racism of individual prejudice. And this is an important distinction, right? But if you're the leadership of the Women's March and a nominee for the uh, presidency of the United States is calling you, I forget exactly what Gillibrand called them, but it was some like, crazy hyperbolic praise, the most important women in America since, um, I don't know what it was, Sojourner Truth or something. I, I can't remember the exact, just like way over the top praise. And you're getting the endorsement of these sort of mainstream establishment liberal figures. That would be the definition of systemic, right? A large organization organizes one of the largest rallies in America becomes the kind of face of the anti-Trump resistance is led by a group of people who espouse openly espouse anti-Semitic views. This is not just about their personal prejudice. This is a structural issue. 
Okay. One more point on sort of the way that the ideological vectors and these things get confused. The mural that you're looking at is by uh, an American graffiti artist named Muir One. It went up in England. It initially got praised by the uh, leader of the Labor Party, Jeremy Corbyn, who later said he hadn't looked closely enough and uh, rescinded that praise. But basically, it's a group of, um, you know, Rothschilds and bankers, sort of cartoonishly uh, figures of like the, the international uh, Zionist conspiracy protocols of the elders sort of thing, uh, you know, conducting the affairs of the world on the backs of uh, the exploited, what appear to be exploited people of color. Um, now you've got the kind of Illuminati symbol in the back with the pyramid the Rothschilds, is this left wing or right wing? Or is it neither left wing or right wing? Now, the, the graffiti artist, Mir One, um, <laughs> you know, it's, I, I, I don't know if he's left wing or I mean, Corbyn endorsed it, but this was on a fairly prominent street in London and took quite a while before there was any kind of public reaction. Public reaction against it occurred only after it received Corbyn's endorsement. But it provides a kind of lurid illustration of the way that these strands get woven together, which is going to be the subject of the next part of this talk. So just keep this image in mind and let me move on. So let's talk for a second uh, about the, the right. Uh, we've talked about the left for a second. You know, unlike on the left, where the, the, the Jewish question is often invoked in whispers, on the right, there's a segment of the right the alt-right or the far-right that's quite pleased with itself for uh, repopularizing the term, the Jewish question. Um, and you can see this mostly expressed online, but it has a way of seeping into the real world as well. And before I get to that seepage, I want to just explain uh, what I mean by these terms. So there were two different titles going around for the talk I was going to give tonight. And one billing, as I understand it, I was going to talk about the changing face of anti-Semitism. And another billing, I was going to talk about the return of the Jewish question. And I want to address what that means and what the distinction is. So a, a brief definition of each of these terms. Anti-Semitism is the modern way to refer to the hatred and suspicion of Jews. That's all it is. It's a relatively recent term came about in the latter part of the 19th century. It's alternately attributed to two different Germans. Uh, it doesn't really matter its precise origins. The point is that the word came about as a secular racialized form of anti-Jewish hatred and suspicion. So it was distinctly modern in the sense that the term Semite, which is a sort of artificial term that was conjured for specifically for this purpose, was supposed to separate it from the old pre-enlightenment Christian attitudes towards Jews. Those were antiquated. These were new ways to describe what, in effect, came out to be many of the same attitudes towards Jews. And anti-Semitism includes all different vectors of this uh, hatred and suspicion of Jews. It's religious scapegoating, which in its earliest form is the accusation that uh, Jews share guilt and perpetuity for the killing of Christ. It's supersessionism, which is the belief that Jews, by holding on to their Old Testament, um, they prevent the full realization of the New Testament, and so by their existence stand in the way of the realization of the kingdom of God, essentially kingdom of heaven. And it also includes the kind of modern racialized um, attitudes that share many of the same features. The Jewish question uh, refers to something different, uh, overlapping but different. Okay? The Jewish question is a, a critical theory of modernity that claims Jews are a kind of permanent problematic minority who are not only different from other members of the larger or ideal society, and it doesn't matter whether that society is Christian, Muslim, or communist, but that their difference is of a kind that cannot be assimilated and causes some sort of problem that will never go away on its own and so requires a large-scale social intervention. 
So the Jewish question, unlike anti-Jewish prejudice, is explicitly modern. It's a function of post-enlightenment thinking and social arrangements. And when it posits that Jews are a political problem, it does so in the context of a particularly modern disposition towards mass politics and social engineering. In other words, the question presupposes the existence of a solution. The Jewish question has to have an answer to the Jewish question. Like anti-Semitism in general, the Jewish question provides a node where otherwise conflicting forces converge. But unlike how we might think of this in the physical world, where if two opposite forces hit each other, they cancel out, in this context, the node actually redoubles the force of the two opposing forces. So where right-wing and left-wing anti-Semitism run into each other, instead of canceling each other out, they create a kind of tactically useful confusion. So there's a, a left-wing variety uh, of the Jewish question that sees Jews as the obstacles to the full realization of the post-enlightenment ideals of society. So Jews are obstacles, essentially, to kind of secular utopianism. The most obvious example uh, for this is from Karl Marx, who famously wrote an essay called The Jewish Question, uh, or On the Jewish Question, rather. And for Marx, um, Jews were synonymous with capitalism. And by being synonymous with capitalism, they were essentially the secular version of a satanic force. Instead of heavenly paradise, there was a earthly paradise, a worker's paradise. And uh, the Jews represented a permanent obstacle to the full realization of the revolution. So to quote from Marx for a second, the Jew has already emancipated himself in a Jewish way. This is from Marx's essay on the Jewish question. Not only in so far as he has acquired financial power, but also insofar as through him and without him, money has risen to world power and the practical Jewish spirit has become the practical spirit of the Christian peoples. The Jews have emancipated themselves to the extent that the Christians have become Jews. There's a lot there. Um, to return to an earlier point, Marx was born Jewish in some hereditary sense, actually, his, I believe it was his grandfather who had converted, so he was born Christian, but was of nominally Jewish lineage, did not in any way prevent him from authoring a tract in which he suggested that, you know, the problem of the world was that it had become Jewish. The problem of modernity was that it had acquired a Jewish character. So this is, a, you know, one version could point to another version that comes from perhaps the, the most important, uh, most canonical, seminal, conservative philosopher, Edmund Burke, who in his work on the French Revolution, essentially blames the French Revolution on uh, Jewish bankers and, and Jewish brokers. Now, what's important about this in both of these cases is not just that they're being anti-Semitic, it's that there were no Jews among the revolutionary class in France. And Burke knows this. Burke doesn't believe that Saint-Just is actually Jewish. I'm, my French pronunciation is horrible, so just bear with me. Um, it's all going to come out in a Brooklyn accent. But Burke knows that they're not Jewish. Jewish for him is a way of describing the ills of modernity, right? And I got to wrap this up in a minute. So let's just stay with Burke and Marx for a second. On the one hand, you have Marx, it's a canonical left-wing left -wing figure. On the other hand, you have Burke, right? Canonical, seminal right-wing figure. For both of them, the sort of nexus of the problem of modernity can be described in symbolic terms through Jewishness. Jews are the figures, the symbolic figures, the abstractions that provide what appear to be answers to totally opposing tendencies, right? Burke wants to go back, he's a reactionary, he wants to restore traditional values, and he sees Jews as uh, modernizers, grubby modern, you know, bankers who place 
mercantile values above traditional values. For Marx, it's the opposite. Marx wants to go forward. He wants to escape religion altogether. You know, and for Marx, the problem with Jews is their particularism, their clannish attachment to these primitive ways that have resulted in these sort of deformed social habits. Capitalism is a, is a kind of Jewishness. Neither one of them is really interested in the least in actual Jews as human beings, but both of them seize on Jewishness as a way of diagnosing the ills of the world. Now, I don't bring this up to suggest that either of them are reducible to only this. I think actually you should read Marx and you should read Burke, and there's a lot to learn from both of them. And I don't think, uh, you know, the point of this is not that we should know platform historical figures. They're each in their own way valuable, but they each share this common, not only a flaw, but a kind of pathological obsession that recurs over and over again. So let me wrap this up. There's a common anti-Semitic trope that depicts Jews as shapeshifters. But to recall my first comment about how a society's attitude towards Jews tells you more about the society than it does about the Jews, it's precisely the anti-Jews who are the shapeshifters. It's the anti-Semites, not the Jews, who practice a kind of magic conjuring Jews into everything everywhere. Now, the, both political sides in America and elsewhere in the world want to treat anti-Semitism as a left-wing or a right-wing issue and then profess shock and alarm at its totally unexpected return. The truth is that the Jewish question doesn't have a political party because anti-Semitism is both a conspiracy theory and a prejudice that is deeply embedded in both Christian and Islamic and universalist tendencies. It's the Catholic Church and Karl Marx. It's the Nazis and John Rawls. It's political Islam and pan-Arabism. And it's right-wing Polish nationalism as well. And Jewish history has shown that the wrapping doesn't really matter as far as the goal of erasing Jews as Jews is concerned. Where does all of this end up? This is, uh, this is not intended to suggest that the primary identity of American Jews should be um, their victimization. It's not to suggest that the primary identity of America should be considered in terms of its attitudes towards Jews or its demonization of Jews. It is to suggest, however, that where this kind of demonization of Jews becomes inflated in public life and where there's this hyper-politicization of Jews and Jewishness, there's both a, threat, both a threat to actual Jews and a, a deeper rot in the society. And finally, that this thing, this difference, this particularism of Jews is not a question, it's not a problem, it's just an irresolvable fact of our existence. To pose it as a question, to presuppose a solution, is to acknowledge that there is a irreconcilable conflict between the continued existence of Jews as Jews. The famous uh, line from the French Revolution is, what is it, all rights uh, to Jews as individuals, none to Jews as a, a nation. Essentially, that if you renounce your Jewishness, you can have full rights as a French citizen, but if you stay attached to your clannish old world ways, um, you don't get any rights collectively as a people. Now, the French Revolution didn't, uh, you know, it, it didn't apply that rule universally. Um, but there's this permanent tension, right, for utopian systems like Marxist system, for religious supersessionist systems. There's a permanent tension between the particularism and the universalism and between these this people who are both a religion and a nation attached to themselves as such and the larger host society in which they find themselves. And it's not the adherence or profession of any political tendency or ideology that's going to solve that problem or inoculate you against its dangers. That's the, the note I would close on.
right? It's, it's not the name of the politics you invoke that tells you whether or not you're extending to other people the basic principles of humanity and decency. Acknowledging their right to exist as they are. It's not the political tendency. Uh, it's not the political party. It's not the ideology. And uh, this elevation of abstractions over actual human beings, which is a literal form of dehumanization, tends to lead to other bloody reforms of dehumanization. Um, a final, final note, because that's pretty grim to end on. <laughs> Things have been a lot worse. Um, but, you know, we had this very particular moment in American history. I, I promise I'm actually finishing now. <laughs> All right. The, the kind of miracle of the past half century, right, the post-war dispensation in America. The thing that was so uh, great about this, and not only for Jews, by the way, it's not just the Jews were successful in American life and in public life the way I described before, uh, getting good educations and getting good jobs. That has happened before. It happened before in America and other periods with German Jews in the early 20th century. Uh, so, so it's not just that. It's not just that material success. What was so unique about the post-war dispensation in America is that the Jewish question became unaskable in public. So the public prohibition was not just against anti-Semitism per se. It was against the uses of Jews as a kind of uh, political uh, instrument. The, the public engagement in Jews as an abstraction. There were always exceptions to this. Pat Buchanan comes to mind. Um, but that was the rule. And that pathological abstraction really for the first time in modern history, became a clear violation in post-war America of a strong social and ethical norm. All right. And uh, that also was concurrent with a period in American life, kind of hot heyday of American liberalism in which, you know, people, the, the idea of the, like the rule of law extending to individuals as individuals was also uh, nominally at least sacrosanct. And um, these two things go together. There was a strong prohibition against for assigning collective guilt and original sin in the political uh, arena. So that's what I think has changed. And uh, I don't think it's impossible to try and restore that norm. I do think it's impossible to restore it in the old version. I think that that kind of post-war American liberal democratic experiment is over, personally. I, it's done. And uh, this is a, an international phenomenon. It's not just in America. I expect over the next 50 years, we'll see some sort of post-liberal dispensation that has all sorts of different meanings depending on who you ask. But whatever this post-liberal order is, it doesn't need to do away with uh, these lessons about the dangers of abstracting the other. It doesn't have to do away with the sense of extending um, dignity uh, to people as individuals without making that contingent on them uh, renouncing the traditions they belong to. Thank you. I have a few questions very quick. Forgive me if one of them kind of cuts against the grain of some of what you were saying, but the first question is, do you worry more about anti-Semitism on the left or on the right in America today? So that's question one. Um, second thing, just a brief comment, and I'd like to hear your comment on my comment, but uh, it strikes me that anti-Semitism within the alt-right actually com combines the Burke and the Marx because it's, you know, they view Jews as agents of social progressivism. They also, though, on the alt-right, aren't very economically libertarian. They're kind of pro-welfare state, not particularly pro-capitalist. And so there's also some animosity toward Jews and Jewish bankers because they see Jews as sort of agents of capitalism. Right. right. Okay. So, and then finally, um, what is your 
deepest explanation, if you have one, of why it's so hard for mainstream leaders, activists, etc., on the left to decry anti-Semitism carried out by, say, minority groups or just groups that aren't the alt-right? So I'm going to say that I actually think that your second question indirectly answers your first question. My glib response to your first question, maybe glib is the wrong word, but my uh, default response would be that I reject the framework. I'm not interested in saying uh, that it's worse on the left than it is on the right, or worse on the right than it is on the left. I think clearly acts of premeditated mass violence are uh, predominantly coming from the right, and that deserves a response that is merits a response that's qualitatively different than the response I think the left deserves. Now, I'm skeptical of the expansion of the security state in general, but I think that people planning terrorist attacks merit a kind of um, punitive and law enforcement response that, uh, you know, the, the kind of left-wing anti-Semitic tropes embedded in, I think, certain platforms of progressivism should not get. This police are not called for there. Um, in general, though, I try to avoid thinking, it's not that I try to avoid, I don't think of it in those terms, and I, I think that uh, it's better to just uh, sort of address these things where they are. It's too widespread at the moment. It'd be one thing if it was a utterly marginal phenomena on the left and a uh, phenomena that was both large and militant on the right, but I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think that they're, they're each dangerous in different ways, though the responses they merit are different. The reason why I said I think the second question, which is a very astute observation, in some way answers the first. So uh, if you go back to 2014, I was a, one of the earlier American journalists writing about the alt-right. Uh, and I wrote... Uh, an article about uh, the Daily Stormer, uh, which is a site some of you might have heard of, run by a guy named Andrew Anglin in 2015. I wrote that for the Daily Beast. I forget what the title was. But basically, part of what I get into at the time is this, this sort of uh, deliberate scrambling of ideology. That occurs both in the sort of anarchic 4chan way with the Daily Stormer and then in a much more actually contrived, intellectualized way in the form of other people. Richard Spencer is a very sort of obvious touchstone. But, you know, one of the ways to understand what the alt-right is that distinguishes it from earlier versions of far-right extremism, and people will tell you that, uh, some people argue that, you know, the term itself alt-right is a kind of, is a bad thing because it masks the fact that this is just the same as old neo-Nazis. I, I reject that. I think that, uh, first of all, if you get too hung up in like what you name things, you're, I think you're missing the point. But secondly, I think that it is qualitatively different. And one of those differences is like they read Gramsci and they read Adorno. And I know this because I've read them on Gramsci and Adorno. And like the alt-right is distinguished in part by the fact that it's very interested in critical theory, right? And part of what that's about is to come back to what the Jewish question is as opposed to anti-Semitism. It's just a crisis of modernity or the idea that there is a crisis of modernity, which is what the Frankfurt School is about in some very fundamental way. That's what the Frankfurt School is interested in, right? And I can read you passages of Adorno or of Horkheimer you wouldn't know whether this is left wing or right wing. To expand on that for a moment, there is an old tradition of right wing anti-capitalism that is as old as left wing anti-capitalism, right? If you were a part of the landed aristocracy in Europe, you were not thrilled with these petite bourgeoisie like depriving you of your, your rentier estate, right? If you were a part of the European nobility, you were not thrilled with the rise of the banker class displacing you. Capitalism was a 
a perversion of the proper social order. The proper social order, of course, if you were an aristocrat, was the one that had you at the top forever. So there's an old right-wing version of anti-capitalism. You're absolutely right to point out that uh, I'm going to keep citing myself, but I, I wrote an article for Politico in 2017 about the ways in which the alt-right is a, a European form of politics. And this has been true in Europe for a very long time. So uh, the National Front in France is essentially a right-wing social welfare state political program. Um, so I'm losing the third question. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I just deepest explanation of why um, it's hard for progressives to. Um, yeah, I mean, I, we kind of, I think, all know the superficial explanation, but just if you have anything deeper to tell. I think there are two aspects of it. I, I think one aspect is that they don't want to uh, alienate people who they consider essential to their electoral strategy. And I think the other part of it is that they are captured by what are nominally secular, but what are fundamentally basically religious ideas of sin and virtue. And that those ideas about sin and virtue are a sort of post-Calvinist, uh, you know, preordination where like certain groups are incapable of being involved in uh, the oppression of other groups based on their history, based on the, what appear to be the power relations between those groups. So if you have, so sort of the specific way, let me not be uh, thought evasive about this specifically. If you have like young black kids in Crown Heights in Brooklyn attacking religious Jews on the street, the superficial reason you can't address that is because to impute a anti-Semitic motive to that, first of all, would uh, cut against the religious, religiously held ethos about punching up and punching down, and the Jews are permanently up, and the black kid is, is permanently down. Now, never mind, like, you don't actually have any clue about who's what, as it turns out, it's no coincidence, let me just not leave before I say this, it's no coincidence that in Brooklyn, the Jews who are getting attacked are the ones without money. The religious Jews in New York are the ones who have the lowest per capita income on average. It doesn't mean that there's no money, but the distribution is uh, uneven in those communities, let's say. But these are not the, it's not happening on the Upper West Side among uh, secular Jews who are more connected to uh, have more money and are more connected to the politi political class. It's precisely the people who are sort of on the margins to begin with who get attacked. So I think that that's the problem. I think that it's an unbelievably uh, damaging way to approach human dignity, race relations, anti-Semitism. I mean, I, I think that for one thing, it like sacrifices these actual Jews in the street at the altar of these uh, ideas, these sort of sacred ideas. The other thing, you don't actually get to the bottom of what's going on. You don't know exactly what the driver of this particular kind of anti-Semitism is, um, how much of it is sort of scapegoating, convenient scape, not driven by any deeper pathological agenda, but a kind of acceptable scapegoat class. So, and, you know, I think just to, as a final comment on that, I think there's like a really perverse implicit premise in that, which is that you couldn't hold the whatever is 20 year old black kid you, who's on video attacking the religious person, religious Jew. You couldn't hold him to the same standard that you would hold the Jew in the reverse circumstance, that there's some qualitative difference in the moral standards to which they should be held, which will be justified in terms of these larger structural conditions. But which, however you justify it in terms of those larger structural conditions, has as its end result that you hold one person to a different moral standard than you hold the other. I think something kind of interesting that you didn't really touch on is the creation of the state of Israel in this continuity of anti-Semitism. And... Um, through that, I think right now we have like Israel in the news and like a lot of rep a lot of viewership of just like 
Israeli the conflict in Israel all throughout the world. So I guess my I have two parts of my question. One is like, um, how do you think the creation of the state of Israel and current sentiments towards the state of Israel here and abroad affect this continuity of anti-Semitism? And also, um, at what point does anti-Zionist sentiment that probably a lot of American Jews agree with, at what point does that anti-Zionist sentiment become anti-Semitism at all, if, if it does at all? Can I ask you a question in return? Yes, you can. So what percentage of Jews would you, American Jews, would you guess agree with that? If a lot agree with it, what would you, as a, take a stab, what would a lot be? What, what, uh, with, um, well, I don't know. I'd say, well, I know 75% of the um, of Jewish people in this country like vote blue or vote Democrats who p would probably support defunding or at least like using their place as an American to um, limit uh, the the whatever rise of or the the American part or the American responsibility in the Israeli occupation. So it's it's almost the reverse actually. It's closer to seventy five percent of Americans, just probably higher than that actually, are broadly supportive of Israel, and that was the default position of the Democratic Party um, for the past fifty years. It's really only begun to change. But let me, let me go back to the original part of your question, which if I understand it was what's the continuity between the creation of the state of Israel and the, the sort of lineage of the Jewish question. I have a tendency of uh, thinking that I'm going to like hit 40 minutes and then at an hour I've only made it through two thirds of my notes. So I had a whole section on that. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get to. But look, it's very interesting because in addition to people like Marx and Burke talking about the Jewish question, there was a third category of people like Theodore Herzl who were talking about the Jewish question. And the Zionists, early Zionists, also talked about the Jewish question, and they understand it not in entirely dissimilar terms, right? It was a response to the rise of nationalism and mass politics in uh, Europe, and the Jews as a, a people apart, a nation within a nation, it was thought uh, because they were never fully assimilable into that host nation, that the only way to solve that problem was for the Jews to have a nation like uh, all other peoples have a nation, or most other peoples have a nation. So there is a very you know, obvious lineage in that sense, right? In another sense, um, the creation of the state of Israel doesn't occur because early Zionists decide that this is the answer to the Jewish question. The state of Israel is created after many false promises and false starts and after the Balfour Declaration in 1917, the UN Partition in 1947, is created essentially uh, through strategic engineering and by force, uh, by force executed politically and to some extent militarily through a people who had uh, mass migrated, thank you, um, it's Israel, a migration that had been going on for many decades before World War II. In the aftermath of the creation of the State of Israel, look, what I would tell you is that I don't think, uh, I reject entirely the idea that Zionism creates anti-Semitism. I think it's a completely misleading premise uh, for the following reason. For one thing, if you look at sort of the moments of the highest degree of, let's call it like uh, anti-Zionist rhetoric, they often accompany moments when, uh, they often accompany uh, spasms of terrorism targeting Israelis. So it's, for instance, it was after the Second Intifada, there's a writer named Paul Berman who I would suggest you check out on this if you're interested, but what Berman points out is that there is this outpouring, this effusion of uh, sort of really pointed anti-Zionist writing coming from the European left during the moment when Israelis are getting uh, blown up in cafes in, in Tel Aviv. Now, that's not a statement about the political policies of Israel, about the uh, Palestinians' uh, rights to uh, national self-determination. That's a separate, not, I can't say an entirely unrelated question, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is anti-Zionism as a very particularized, uh, very exceptionalized form of critique 
Um, and so let me not beat around the bush. I think that you could think about anti-Zionism's relationship to anti-Semitism in a way that's not entirely dissimilar to how you could look at the relationship between racism and people who are obsessed with race and behavioral characteristics, right? See, there are people who uh, can't stop thinking about uh, you know, genetics of race and the hereditary components of race and IQ and, and uh, uh, criminal behavior or, or antisocial behavior or uh, sort of medical epidemiology. I think that's the wrong word, but something that sounds sort of like that. There is some small sliver of those people who are interested in this for technical reasons, right? Typically, it's a pretty good indication when that's somebody's obsession that they're racist. That's what the, that's what the not the interest, but the obsession shows you. The exceptionalizing of Israel uh, occurs because anti-Zionism provides, you know, I talked before about how after World War II, you couldn't attack Jews as Jews. Anti-Zionism is a vector through which those same energies can be channeled. And uh, I think that's obvious in terms of the kind of um, disproportionate reactions that Israel provokes relative to, uh, I don't know, you know, the Syrian civil war, which was an act of open air butchery and actual genocide or attempted genocide of sorts over the past 10 years that, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of moral indignation that's provoked is, is not the same. So anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are not technically synonymous, but they often travel together. As a Jew who, like, criticizes the state of Israel and, like, the actions of the state of Israel, like, from, like, I guess, like, my inherited Jewish values, and from that I, I use those to see, like, what I view as right and wrong in, in this country. So how can one, like, an American Jew, I guess, who is or a progressive American Jew, criticize the like ultra right wing government of Israel while also um, not aligning with anti-Semitic sentiment and not and like how, how as a Jew do I uh, like keep those distinct keep those things distinguished? I don't think that criticizing how did you put it the right wing government in Israel? Yeah. Or, yeah. I, I don't think that point. has anything to do with anti-Zionism anti is a very simple concept that refers to the idea that Israel shouldn't exist anymore and that the Jews don't have a right uh, to a state, or that the Jewish state, exceptionally among all the other nation states on earth, has to forfeit its right to existence because it's guilty of exceptional crimes. That's what it means. That's what anti-Zionism means in practice. It's not the same thing that it meant to Bundists in 1875 or whatever. That's what it means today. I think you can criticize the policies of the Israeli government in the most vehement if, like, if you want uh, obscene terms, and you would sound like a lot of Israelis, I know. I don't think that has anything to do with anti-Semitism. I think it's only when you're traveling in the, the idea. Look, one aspect of anti-Zionism is just a sort of transmuted anti-Semitism. There's another aspect of anti-Zionism, which is what I call nationalism by proxy, right? Palestinian self-determination is a national movement. It's only upheld as this sort of exemplar of universal values by people with no interest, uh, for the most part, no interest in the actual conditions of human Palestinians, who, by the way, compete with Jews for being the most abstracted, symbolically inflated people on earth. Um, but th this is a national movement. And I think it's a bit strange that so many people who are so allergic to nationalism in every other form or so attached to it in this form, but I don't think that the nationalism itself is legitimate necessarily. Um, so yeah, I, I honestly, people bring this question up, I think, because they're led to believe that criticism of Israel is often conflated with anti-Semitism. I don't think that actually happens that often, though it does happen, and you can just call it out. You know, if you see somebody making a false comparison, you could call it out or lobbying a false charge, you could call it out, but I think anti-Zionism is typically some form of anti-Semitism. Uh, so very early in your talk, you uh, mentioned how ideas matter more than they did, uh, and you also mentioned conflict. Uh, 
consistently throughout the talk, and I was wondering uh, if you were uh, familiar with the article Jihad versus with Mick World, uh, which argues that society will either homogenize or fall into increased identity conflict. Uh, and I wanted to know what your thoughts were on that idea. Yeah, I am familiar with that article. Um, I'm sorry, did restate the, the very last part of that? What my uh, thoughts on the well, article? Well, do, you, do you think that society today, as a, as a global society, whether we are headed towards Mick World or uh, Jihad? I think that that's a sort of crude gesture at something that is happening, but that like that formulation is uh, reductive and misses a lot. I think that the sort of post-war liberal democratic order is uh, more or less vanquished itself. Um, not in every aspect, um, but is basically already over and we're sort of, we're huffing the fumes now. Where it goes from here is not clear. I mean, there are other options other than Jihad or McWorld, right? China is neither Jihad or McWorld, but is doing pretty well these days. Unless you consider, you know, the One Road project, a sort of version of McWorld. And I would call that actually more like Imperium. You know, it's, it's an empire much more than it is a kind of global, uh, unitary global state. So the kind of liberal nation state order, Westphalianism or, or whatever um, you want to call it, I think is in a state of real flux. Um, and fundamentalism uh, is on the rise, um, typically almost always more as an expression of uh, internal conditions in a society as opposed to sort of geostrategic competition. That's the driver of, of fundamentalism. Um, but that there are other possibilities. China is one, but also the resurgent small nation state is another, right? Like the sudden political uh, importance of Poland is not something I think most people would have predicted 15 years ago that Hungary and Poland, I, I'm not saying these are positive examples, um, though I think they're, they're mixed, but that's not something a lot of people would have predicted, I don't think. Brexit was not something a lot of people would have predicted, and that's a sort of third way. So Thank you. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. What would you say about the rise in university classrooms, especially in more liberal universities, of erasing stuff like the Holocaust and Jewish discrimination over time to kind of more push the narrative that like the Jews are the ones in power now? I think that it, it occurs not only because of ideology, but also because of sort of structural conditions. So, you know, I believe I was critical of Marx in this talk in some ways, but you know, I'm somebody who uh, is influenced by some of the ideas of kind of dialectical materialism. And I, I don't think ideas are the only things that matter. I think that ideas and material conditions uh, are in, engaged in this sort of interplay where both are consequential. So in the universities, what you're looking at is an administrative fiefdom, which is, you know, you could sort of apply to America, America more broadly. My, Parents were both academics. Let me just say that now before I bash academia. Uh, I think that the, uh, the sort of expansion of a kind of ideological administrative class um, is very much connected to the promotion of certain um, uh, sort of ideological dogmas in universities. And I think that those ideological dogmas in turn, educate an administrative class that goes out and fills the uh, bureaucracies in America and sort of positions of, a uh, uh, number of positions of kind of uh, uh, cultural, of the cultural elite in the media and elsewhere. That happens, that history that you're talking about where the Holocaust either needs to be de-particularized, so it's not just about Jews. We have to be very careful not to uh, make the Holocaust just about Jews, or the Holocaust is something that we, we try and avoid talking about altogether because we 
we don't want to dwell too much on the victimization of Jews given their economic privilege in America. I think it's related to these larger structures, but that also, um, you know, Jews should be, have a leading role in defining anti-Semitism and in defining Jewish history. That's true for all groups, I believe. It's, you're not the only people who have a say in it, but uh, you know, your voice is, is predominant in defining the terms of, of what that looks like. And I think that the erasure of Jews from the Holocaust is like explicitly anti-Semitic, even if it's framed in what are supposed to be sort of whatever progressive or, or intersectional terms. It, it doesn't mean that you can't talk about other people who were persecuted in the Holocaust. But let me give you one sort of concrete example of something I think is uh, related to this. There was a panel conference about anti-Semitism in New York like two years ago uh, put on by a left-wing Jewish group called, um, I think it was Jewish Voices for Peace that put it on, uh, but it might have been one of the other ones. And I think the only, there's like, one Jewish person out of like three people on a panel about anti-Semitism and Linda Sarsour was on the panel. And um, I think that sends a signal, right? This is not a statement about Linda Sarsour more generally, who I, I could talk about more generally, but I think that that sense of Jews being uh, pushed out of the conversation about Jews and about anti-Semitism is a standard applied uniquely to Jews, sort of the reverse of the standard applied elsewhere, and it's pernicious and should be challenged. I feel like that's a very unsatisfying answer, but I don't know that I'm gonna do any better right now. This isn't so much a question as I'm wondering what your opinion on this is. So in the past few years, um, like Jewish organizations on college campuses, like t to mention one, like the Hillel organization, um, has been, if not kicked off, like protested against by students because of its affiliation and support for the state of Israel. And this is kind of like the question that was asked previously. Um, do you think that uh, promotion of like anti-Zionism is a, a almost like a fast track to getting more people to become more anti-Semitic? Like, do you think that it increases the likelihood that people or students on college campuses will develop like anti-Semitic tendencies or just what are your thoughts yes. on that? Yes, okay. a short, short answer, yes. Okay. Um, again, this is not about criticism of the state of Israel or the policies of the Israeli government in terms of the occupation mm -hmm. or anything else. But, I mean, look, if you look at universities taking Saudi money, Chinese money, uh, the Chinese government has, how many people are in internment camps right now? How many people has the Assad regime butchered? Um, do I think that the exceptionalizing of Israel as the repository of the only settler colonial state in existence, like the last bastion of Western imperialism, a country that's now it, either 50% or over 50% uh, Jews from Arab states, mm. Mizrahi Jews who are not white or not European. Do I think that the like, pathological demonization of Israel is a vector for the spread of anti-Semitism? The answer is simple, yes. I also think that it's like, these are forms of secular religion, essentially. And um, I don't know that it's always, and I, I didn't know, I don't know that I felt this way when I was an undergrad. I don't think it's always the best use of time to get involved in sort of tit for tat debates about these things. I'm not sure. I think. Sometimes you end up seeding too many premises. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I frankly, I like, I'm not interested in arguing about whether or not Israel has a right to exist. It's not mm -hmm. whether Zionism was some crime unique in the history of the world. I'm just not interested in that. Um, people who want to have that conversation have already sort of, to me, suggested a set of uh, what are typically like, implacable, emotional mm -hmm. preoccupation. You know, it's not applies to every single person, but 
I don't know, man, life's too short. You know, I got other things to do with my day. But um, which is not to say I won't debate Israel or whatever, but like that mm -hmm. sort of thing. You know, listen, SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, two incidents with them recently. There was a Holocaust survivor who was giving a talk on anti-Semitism. I forget what university this was at a few weeks ago. They went to this talk and like, in the midst of a talk that had nothing to do with Israel, which the guy never mentioned Israel, he was asked whether as a survivor himself he would um, condemn the genocide against Palestinians. Something You can look up the video online if you're interested. I mean, that's brazen, cartoonish anti-Semitism. But you have, I think, large swaths of people who will go to great lengths to avoid making a very obvious conclusion about that. This guy wasn't, had no connection to Israel. His response to the question was like, I don't really know that much about Israel. But as a Jew, he bears some special responsibility for this place that is the site of this special crime in which all these other people have invested their energies. You know? Mm -hmm. so like, you think it's like an accident that Swedish newspapers carry 30 articles a day about what's going on in Gaza, give a shit about what's going on in you know, wherever, like in, in China, in Liberia, in uh, Syria. But, you know, there's like this obsessive pathological interest in Israel. That's, mm -hmm. that's uh, what is that about? I, I think, I think it's clear. Again, I, I don't know that I answered your question, but uh, okay. Hi, so you've written about um, Paul Gottfried and his sort of role in sort of the founding of the alt-right um, ideology. I was just wondering if you could comment, I know uh, sort of it's blown up a lot in recent days, like Stephen Miller and the idea of him as like a white nationalist, but a Jew, um, and sort of how you see that sort of paradoxical existence of like a Jew involved in ideologies that are explicitly anti-Jewish. Uh, good question. Extra credit for having read the Gottfried piece. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, I, I know the Gottfried case much better than I know the uh, Stephen Miller case and have written about. Uh, Paul Gottfried is a Jewish intellectual who uh, was a kind of mentor to Richard Spencer and um, has now disavowed Richard Spencer, but only sort of. And, uh, you know, Gottfried's a sort of particular sort of paleoconservative crank and there's like sort of a category of one. Miller is probably more representative of something, which is, um, like I think that uh, from what I've, I have not read all the stuff that just came out, so I don't want to comment on the specifics. My understanding is that he was telling a reporter that she should link to American Renaissance articles, is that? Okay, so that much, which I know about, if I could just talk about that in isolation, I would say that's evidence of serious, uh, I don't know, it's like strong evidence of racism. I don't know that Miller's a racist. I know that that suggests to me a willingness to cross what I consider a bright red line, right? And the version of racism that you find on American Renaissance, which is not exactly the same version that you find on Stormfront, which is not exactly the same version that you find on V-Day or whatever, like I think the, the kind on American Renaissance is bad enough. I would call the kind on American Renaissance uh, more a kind of ugly racialist nativism. But you know, look, I'm somebody who has fairly uh, <laughs> peculiar ideas about politics. I'm not wasn't that interested in politics for a lot of my life. So I didn't, like, I don't have, a, uh, I, like, my views weren't formed in a kind of whole way where I, like, took on, you know what I mean? I, like, picked something here and there because I, I didn't think I cared about it for a long time. And so, you know, for instance, I don't think that uh, all immigration restrictionism is racist, you know, which seems to be what parts of the, uh, progressive wing. The Democrats are moving towards that like anything other than basically actual open borders policy is racist. You know, Bernie Sanders called that like libertarian, Koch brothers libertarian delusion three years ago. Now he's realized he has to back off because where the party's moved. I agree with Bernie from three years ago, you know. Um, that being said, the same way like you can criticize Israel without uh, denying its right to exist or suggesting that 
the only Jewish state in the world should dissolve itself for other people's ideas about justice. Um, you can promote immigration policies without being a nativist, without dehumanizing immigrants, without suggesting that there ought to be a racial criteria in what people we accept to America. And I think I had a thing about um, Tucker Carlson having baked Alaska on his television program. I think it's a good example of like the creep of these things and the creep of the Jewish question. Baked Alaska is this, like, think about Milo Yiannopoulos for a second, but dumber and more cynical, you know? But also with bleached blonde hair and a former YouTube rapper uh, who then joined the alt-right. So he was like a BuzzFeed employee, YouTube rapper, bleached blonde, alt-right guy. He started tweeting about the Jewish question. I mean, like, uh, that's who he actually was. That guy that I just described, Tucker Carlson, cited on his program as a source, a credible source, uh, about uh, liberal media bias at BuzzFeed, okay? In the context of talking about the Steele dossier. So the, the parallel works for me in particular because I think that the, the media's treatment of the Steele dossier, which is a pretty obvious forgery at this point, was Bad. Like, there were real problems. I think there have been huge problems with how the media, how journalists have approached the Russiagate stuff. And I think there's been a degree of credulousness with some of the stuff, like the Steele dossier, for instance, and all the stuff about a P tape. Like, just like wild, lurid, conspiratorial stuff of a different stripe that should be investigated. But Carlson, in making this point, brings on Baked Alaska, the alt-right guy who tweets about the Jewish question, to go after Ben Smith, the Jewish editor of BuzzFeed, in this segment. Like, that's the sort of seepage, I think, that's occurring right now at this moment. And Carlson does the same thing. And I happen to think Carlson, like in purely sort of uh, broadcast terms, is by far the best broadcaster on TV, right? He's by far the most effective. Um, I think he's very good at what he does. I also think that he's constantly crossing bright red lines. It doesn't mean that I disagree with everything he says, but for instance, you know, he ran a segment on um, gypsies defecating on the street in a town in Pennsylvania. This is exactly what I'm talking about with immigration policy and nativism. It's like grotesque, grotesque dehumanizing stuff, right? To, to suggest that the, we should be considering these animalistic people who are so, so uncivilized, they defecate on the streets, that that should be how we, we conceptualize immigration policy. I think is a despicable, um, I'm, I'm relying on moralizing terms, but I think is a, a sort of despicable frame that, that isn't actually necessary to make a cogent critique of immigration policy, for instance. So, Let me actually, speaking of that, I didn't actually finish addressing, so just give me one second. There's a, a divide in the, among American Jews between the principal political divide among American Jews is actually not between Republicans and Democrats. It's between traditionally religiously observant Jews and more modern secular Jews. Traditional religiously observant Jews tend to be more conservative. They're also having a lot more babies, right? So, and they don't assimilate in the same way. And the uh, rates of intergenerational transmission are higher. So they have more babies and more of those babies stay Jewish and have more babies. So one group is growing and the other group is shrinking for different reasons. The group that's growing is more conservative, uh, voted for Trump in the majority. The group that's shrinking is more democratic and voted against Trump in the majority. The group that's growing does not share many of the same foundational precepts about politics that the secular Jewish Democrat group uh, was formed by. Now, Miller is not religiously observant, so he doesn't quite belong to that category, but there's a type of person like Gottfried, let's say, who views 
excuse me, who views uh, white nationalists perhaps as useful allies, excuse me, as long as they're polite white nationalists and they sort of stay within acceptable boundaries, right? So like, you know, Miller wouldn't invite Baked Alaska to his house, but would he have Jared Taylor, the editor of American Renaissance, over? Maybe, maybe he would if he thought it wouldn't get him in trouble. Famously, uh, Jared Taylor, there was a split among the early white nationalist movement over whether American Renaissance should allow Jews into the organization. Uh, and uh, Jared Taylor was like, you know, he didn't want to ban Jews. Uh, this is marginal stuff, though. This is marginal stuff. Like, Miller is a unique individual, but again, you know, upwards of 70 something percent of American Jews are still Democrats. Not only do they not have anything to do with white nationalism, they don't have anything to do with the Republican Party at the moment. But it's not impossible, of course. I mean, these um, people can make not only strange bedfellows, but sometimes, you know, dangerous bedfellows. So. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned that there's no like political strain or ideology that immunizes you from anti-Semitism. But like, I, I think part of that is in the United States we have these two big parties, so there are huge tents, and there might be anti-Semitic elements in both. But looking across the world, there are some movements that are much more resistant to anti-Semitism. Like you talked about the current strains of anti-Semitic thought being that you know Jews are either the the fifth column injecting social progressivism or neo-Marxism or whatever, or the Jews are like the capitalists, the bankers, or the successful Israelis or so on. But it, like there are political movements that have neither of those strains, right? Like in, in the United Kingdom, the Liberal Democrats are sort of a haven for many Jews, you know, socially progressive, economically liberal parties that have bases in like educated. Uh, urban classes, right, in France, the party of Macron, in Poland, the opposition main party, in Hungary, some of the newer, like, uh, civil society-based moderate parties. So it seems like if, if you have neither the sort of extreme economic left nor the ethno-nationalist right, there's simply, it, it's possible you could have leftover anti-Semitism, but it seems like there's no ideological strain to re-inject it into politics. So, like, are, are those parties sort of and we don't have them in the United States because we have a two-party system, but are those parties safe from anti-Semitism? Because it seems like empirically they generally are. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so the answer is that those parties uh, are more resistant. Liberalism, small l liberalism, traditionally has been the most resistant because it recognizes the importance of pluralism because it rejects the essentializing of the right and the utopianism of the left. The problem with liber liberalism is that it has hollowed out its kind of meritocratic core. And the sort of, um, you know, I'm trying to think how to, how to put this, that, that won't sound like uh, overly uh, politicized or something, but the, the kind of corrupt version of liberalism that um, we have now, just talking about America, for instance, is unable to preserve its own values, right? So in other words, like a liberalism that is no longer confident in saying the rule of law is important, Right, and in it, whether it's in uh, with allegations of sexual assault or uh, other highly morally charged incidents, isn't really liberal anymore in any meaningful sense. Actually, uh, what it is is a party of the financialized elite and like woke progressives, and uh, but but not particularly liberal actually. Um, so that's the answer in the American context. The other examples that you're talking about overseas are, look, you, you raise a very good counterpoint. They are more resistant. Macronism, I'm afraid, it suffers from all the same problems I just described, but we'll see. It's an experiment. But uh, I, I don't think <laughs> Macronism is durable, let's say. Um, the opposition party in Poland is an interesting case. Uh, they are more resistant, um, but the, the 
point, like this sort of essential point, right, is that the thing about Jews is the particularism, right? There's an irreducible quality. And that irreducible quality presents a permanent tension, a tension between the particularism and the universalism, between the nation within a nation and the larger nation, the people apart and the utopian project, the people apart and the restoration of the old social order, whatever form it takes, and it'll take different forms in the future. But there's parties slide, ideologies slide, and that tension is permanent. So some are better designed, more resistant, but I, I, don't, I just don't think politics, I talked about conflict a lot, you know, politics is a form of conflict and deliberate action taking and decision making. It, there is no permanent solution to any of it. There is no uh, conceptual answer, like if we just design the right political program. There are protections, there are uh, habits that are inculcated, there are legal restraints, etc. But some, some cultures, some politics are much, much more resistant to it um, than others, but I, I would just argue that none is uh, completely or permanently immune. Is there hope for, you know, a, a fall in anti-Semitism? In the near term in America or? Yeah, like for the, the current trends to reverse. Um, I certainly think it's possible, but I, I think it, the prerequisite in New York, for instance, would be honesty, right? You could wait. De Blasio seems to have taken the approach along with other parts of the city's political leadership, like, let's just wait this out. Hopefully no one will get killed. Hopefully we won't have a riot. Like, let's just staff some new hate crimes office. This was the big solution in New York was to create a new hate crimes office in City Hall. Meanwhile. City Hall already has a human rights office. The NYPD already has a hate crimes task force. The DA already has a hate crimes task force. So staffing a new office with a budget of half a million dollars and like three employees, which was the solution they came up with after a year and a half of this, does not inspire confidence, let me say. Um, but this is a problem that there are you know, solutions to or that there are... Uh, it's not like it can't be addressed, but, you know, it starts with being honest about it. And in New York, for instance, the unwillingness to, to be honest about this is a real problem. I would say that, uh, you know, the, the unwillingness to deal honestly, I think, with some of the uh, vectors of right-wing anti-Semitism is also a problem. I'm, I'm somebody who... Um, uh, I think the sort of the causes of some of these lone shooters are uh, complicated. Not, uh, I don't mean to suggest that like, that's not a question of culpability or, or ideological responsibility or whatever. I just think um, the ways people get radicalized online or sometimes there's a caricaturized version of that. like. You watch Joe Rogan on YouTube today and tomorrow you're a Nazi or whatever. You know, it's like a politically convenient um, way of tarring one's enemies. And I don't think that's how it actually works. On the other hand, I do think there are uh, ways to sort of disrupt this radicalization cycle. But th those are more discrete answers that I'm giving you more broadly. I think that attempts to restore the prohibition sort of informal prohibition on like public uh, symbolic pronouncements about Jews, about the sort of de-exceptionalizing of Jews, um, which is something that you can only really achieve through a kind of cultural consensus, um, can't be like enforced by law, is very important. But you can, you can influence the, that cultural consensus through uh, elite institutions, through universities, through the political party system, and that there's generally an unwillingness to do that right now. So faced with that unwillingness, what you're basically looking at is like an ebb and a flow, and you know, events are 
contingent, so if something bad happens, there's a, another financial crisis. If there's another big financial crisis, watch out, things are going to get bad for everybody. But um, The way you talk about the exceptionalizing of Jews is pretty similar to the way that a lot of people on the right, particularly the more populist or even alt-right, are talking about the exceptionalizing of white people. And so I was wondering if you could just comment on that. Second, many here might not know this, but there's an interesting schism unfolding within the pro-Trump youth activist movement um, right now uh, between most prominently Charlie Kirk's Turning Point USA and then the America First movement led by Nick Fuentes and his groipers. And um, some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, And I think you know a bit about Nick Fuentes. Um, And so I was wondering if you... Uh, if you could comment on that, because it's very topical. This is happening on November 13th, 2019. We're right in the thick of yeah, yeah. that schism. So, yeah. So the the similarities between the kind of conceptual framework that the alt-right uses to talk about attitudes towards white people and what I'm talking about with the exceptionalizing of Jews, um, there are some resonances there. Particularism, what I mean by particularism is that... <coughs> Um, this unique quality of Jews as the nation within a nation, as the people apart, has caused problems uh, wherever they've gone, more or less. And part of the problem, the sort of the degree of problem that's caused is the degree to which that society is able to accommodate that particularism, right? Like, can you deal with these people who you don't want to assimilate necessarily, right? Like who you want to stay apart, but who you're then offended by their staying apart. Like how do you deal with that and accommodate that? And the Jewish particularism has very deep, deep roots that sort of relate to the idea of chosenness and the covenant with God and this intense system of law um, that, you know, it it doesn't go away quickly. and has proved quite durable over the millennia. Um, And so that particularism is part of why Jews are then exceptionalized. Because if you think of like in the generic sense, there's an other. Jews are the omni-other, right? Like they're the other that um, can play any role of the other and that is controlling the world. So that's what I mean by the exceptionalizing. What the alt-right talks about uh, is the way in which whiteness has become a kind of symbolic vector for parts of progressive, uh, progressive politics, which, you know, it's no endorsement of the alt-right to say that I think uh, racial politics in general and uh, sort of... Uh, the promotion of ideas of racial original sin are poisonous, incompatible with uh, the long-term viability of a multi-ethnic democracy, um, and a terrible strategy uh, for the people who are pursuing it. It won't turn out well for them either, I I think. Um, But it also has created created a unique situation where Jews are these sort of hyper-white figures in the um, sort of hierarchy of the left, I think I mentioned in the talk, the alt-right, the irony with the alt-right or the contradiction or deception with the alt-right is they're also believers in the exceptional, you know, like they reject the exceptionalizing of whiteness in terms of its sin, but promote the exceptionalizing of whiteness in terms of its virtue, right? So that's what the alt-right does, as distinct from, let's say, other conservatives or liberals or whoever who just reject racial politics, right? But the the move of the alt-right is to decry the demonization of whiteness correctly on behalf of an equally poisonous version of racial politics, Um, you know, Politics built on ideas about racial sin and virtue are uniquely uh, dangerous in multi-ethnic societies. And the the erasure of 
the very brief period of like a strong social taboo against them in America, which was a, a very hard fought and always precarious victory, but like the, the disposal of that um, in favor of new forms of racial politics is a, a bad idea. Um, I'm sorry, the Fuentes. Uh, okay, so I was gonna pull up the article, but if you are interested, uh, I, I address this very directly in two pieces. I've written in the past, the first is in the Paul Godfrey piece, and then the second is this piece I wrote for Politico about, I think it's called like the European roots of the alt-right. It's something like that. But basically the alt-right very deliberately sees itself as a anti-liberal movement, right? Small C conservatism in America is a small L liberal movement, meaning pro-free markets, pro-individualism, pro-religious tolerance, right? The alt-right's a reactionary movement, and it's, uh, whether reactionary in a fascist direction, it's muddled, but it is not liberal, and it is very pointedly anti-liberal. The turning point people, though they're conservatives, have not broken with the tradition of American liberalism. And the reason why it's important to understand that the alt-right's a European movement is because there's something constitutionally <coughs> anti-American in the alt-right. And by anti I don't use that as a way to like demonize them. You're anti-American. I, I don't think it would bother them that I'm calling them anti-American. But descriptively, like historically, it's important to understand because if you look at who their influences are, if you look at what the past that they want to restore is, it's not the American founding. Right? Uh, America is founded in a liberal tradition, a small L liberal tradition. It's not the only tradition America is founded in. There are different uh, sort of streams feeding into the American political tradition, one of which is this very philo-Semitic um, uh, British sort of restoration of, of uh, Hebrew society. There, there are different elements, but it is most sort of fundamentally a small, limited government, individual rights. That's not what the alt-right is. Uh, and the reason why that's not what the alt-right is, in part, is because they want to restore a pre-liberal hierarchical society where there is not a Millsian market and exchange of ideas to determine the winner. There is a preordained hierarchy, right? So they definitely don't like Mills, for instance. So sometimes there's a confusion about this in the sort of mainstream discourse where conservatives, you know, Ben Shapiro, for instance, whatever you think about him, is certainly not a member of the alt-right. Neither, for that matter, are like, I'm trying to think who, pick somebody at National Review. Uh, who's the guy who got fired from the Atlantic? Uh, Kevin something. Kevin Williamson. Who's a, even weirder, he's not even a small L liberal, he's like a Mencanite libertarian or something like that. But, um, but there's sometimes this confusion between conservatism and reactionary politics and they're, they're not the same. They're actually, though they can form tactical alliances, they're actually in direct conflict. And so the Fuentes group is the young reactionary group for whom the most important thing is opposition to the sort of establishment, the boomer liberal establishment, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an oppositional insurgent political movement and for them, like Turning Points USA is like old corporate GOP. And this goes back to Paul Gottfried and to a, a critique that goes all the way back really to the late 70s and to the early 1980s. And in a sense, it really sort of starts with Reagan, but then it explodes in this opposition between neoconservatism and paleoconservatism. And, um, and in some ways, this is a sort of, deranged replay of that, uh, but like, you know, more, um, 
violent and, and more younger. Um, so Fuentes is like a illiberal reactionary. The turning points people are populist conservatives. And was it was the Fuentes people who went to the turning points thing and uh, yes, sort of yelling about sodomy and all that and yeah, uh, yeah, about sodomy and right. Yeah. So the the turning points and, people, and a lot about demographics. Right, yeah. I missed that. But not surprising. Yeah. yeah, the turning points people are um, they're a new form of conservatism. They're populist and they, and they call TPUSA conservatism Inc. To your point, that's what Fuentes called it. Yeah, exactly. That term. Conservatism Inc. goes back to the original dispute between paleoconservatives and neoconservatives. So I believe it's Paul Gottfried who actually came up with Conservative Inc., but if it wasn't Gottfried himself, it was somebody in that circle, which at that time referred to itself as the dissident right. It was a uh, precursor of the alt right. Um, Gottfried, along with Richard Spencer, came up with the name Alternative Right. It came from a, the title of a speech that Gottfried gave. Um, but that term, conservative Inc., referred to, the, you know, the famous complaint is, what have the conservatives conserved, right? Um, yeah, and one of the questioners at, in Ohio said precisely that, like, what are you doing, Charlie Kirk, to conserve Christian morality in particular? That right. was, and and, and I, I watched Nick Fuentes kind of streaming that and commenting on it, and when that guy said that, he, like, just started, like, Right, you know. right. I mean, the, the thing about this, this sort of one of the kind of derangements in that element of the all right is like, to think you could have a sort of unitary um, Christian imperium in America. is a pretty fundamental misreading of the nature of the American political scene, not only in terms of values, right? But also, it's a big country, right? Part of the reason America is what it is, it has the character that it has, is because of a regionalism that's unavoidable. You can't make the salt flats of Utah the same as the upper Midwest. You can't make rural Maine the same as Newark, New Jersey. Okay, well, just to play devil's advocate, sure. what would you, I mean, I'm guessing that if Fuentes or a Groiper were here right now, they would say something, something along the lines of, you know, up until 1970, the U.S. was overwhelmingly non-Hispanic, white, and practicing Christian. And now, like, less than half the country is. In response to your saying it's a fundamental, they're making, they have a fundamental misreading of American history, they would say, no, actually, in practice on the ground, the U.S. was a white Christian country up until the last couple of generations. Uh I'm going to address that, but just speaking of if they were here, I don't know if I mentioned that Richard Spencer came to a talk I gave last year and asked a question and then came up to me after the talk and tried to shake my hand. And I said, ah, I'm not going to shake your hand. <laughs> and he said, you'll answer my question, but you won't shake my hand. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll answer your question, but I won't shake your hand. Go ahead and ask your question if you want, because I'm not going to stay here all night. Um, but... Um, yeah, so uh, that's true, right? Uh, it was a much more white Christian country. Um, so, and, and there was a degree of uh, social consensus in a country that was more monoethnic that you're not going to have in a country that's more uh, multi-ethnic and has less people of the same background. That's true. When they talk about this great... Uh, demographic term that I think what's the year the uh, 1960 uh, 1965 the immigration 1965 act. by 65 though the old Protestant elite had already been displaced so there had already been a series of large scale changes in the in a, uh, American demographics but look on a certain level as with a number of uh, critiques that you get from the far right as with the far left like there's a grain a kernel of truth in this uh, there has been a large scale demographic change. This is not, this argument that they're making rhymes with the argument that Samuel Huntington made about whether America is a propositional nation, meaning a nation based on a creed, or uh, what was the term he used? Uh, like a, a people or a tribe? A, a people. Yeah. Essentially, like, was America defined, was the character of America defined by the founding stock? Uh, Anglo-Saxon, 
uh, Protestant, particular religious background, et cetera, or is it defined by the espoused values into which any peoples could be absorbed? Um, the answer is it's probably some of both. Um, but the, even if you take that to be true, right? The idea that you find among the alt-right, not entirely different from a kind of Catholic integralist position that's become ascendant, which presumes that that degree of kind of demographic and uh, attendant social cohesion is the same as a uh, monarchical state-driven society. This is like an underlying degree of social consensus was the prerequisite for a degree of massive behavioral, regional diversity, different moral customs. What do you do with Joseph Smith? What do you do with Mormonism, right? Like, it's the most American of all religions, right? <laughs> In every sense. It is, it's the American religion. A fascinating, fascinating history, right? But what do the integralists do? Integralism is a kind of Catholic political philosophy in which uh, the state is subordinated um, to the Catholic higher good. Basically like the Vatican, uh, mm -hmm. Catholics interpreting the orders of the Vatican direct to the organs of the state. Basically you could think of it as like a Catholic monarchy. So it's theocracy. I mean, Nick, Nick Fuentes yes. himself says that the U.S. is a theocracy. Is uh, it, it's now a theocracy. Or no, uh, should be, used to be, effectively right. was. That idea, that's the misreading of America. And it, it conflates the degree of kind of demographic, social consensus. It conflates that with uh, America being a, a feudal monarchical society in which the rightly ordered good is enforced. And, you know, it's, this stuff is fundamentally childish in a lot of these versions. It's people who don't care about history. I think the integralists are different. I think a lot of the integralists are highly educated um, and just wrong, but... You, you know Adrian Vermeule? Yes, I do. What about Sorab Amari? Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, we, we invited both of those, and Sorab Amari is coming oh, in, great. in the spring. Great. Um, yeah, I don't know if he would call himself an integralist. Eh, I but, think he would. Yeah, but Vermeule definitely does. Sorab's, if he doesn't call himself one, it uh, doesn't mean he's not one. Um, you could just read his stuff. Maybe he's not quite there. He's, he's pretty damn close. Uh, but I think Sorab's a very smart guy. I don't, Vermeule's a very smart guy. I don't dismiss either of them. I think that they misread. Look, the, the, I did a podcast with a guy named Michael Brendan Doherty, who's a writer at National Review, in which we talked about uh, the new conservative manifestos. And when two of the manifestos we talked about came out of First Things, which is the sort of, one of them was a Vermeule piece, and one of them was a piece that Amari was a co-signatory to, which was against the dead consensus. Basically, one way to understand the split on the right, the non-alt-right right, is between nationalists and statists. And the nationalists are, in my opinion, whether you think they're right or wrong, more rooted in the American tradition, right? So like that kind of pre-demographic change idea, like there was an American nation state um, which had demography as one component, though never the sole component, and always in flux and always sort of being renegotiated. But there was the idea of an American nation, an American nation state that was defined at different periods in different ways, and often sort of these identities are consolidated only by war. You know, they start to spin out, and you get a war, it brings it back together. There's, that's nationalism. For the in is it, you say integralists? I'm never sure how to pronounce it. For the integralists, nationalism is actually a kind of idolatry, right? Because nationalism places the identity of these people, the American, above the identity of the, the Christian servant of God. And so some of them will put it this way, but some of them won't put it this way, but I think it's implicit in their ideas. 
So to be an American nationalist, or too fervent an American nationalist, is to be a kind of idolater. And so what they're after, and you get this very clearly in the writing of a guy, very, very smart guy named Gladden Pappen, what you get is a kind of pre-modern statism in which the point is not to, reconst- not to reinvigorate America, not to make America great again, right, which is the nationalist position, more the populist position. The integralist position is a, a vanguardist or an elitist position, and it is let's get good Catholics in positions of power in the organs of the state. Let's take over the state. Forget about the nation, the body politic. Let's take over the state. Once we have the commanding heights of the state, right, then we will reorient society towards the higher good, the higher good as defined by the church. Those are two incompatible competing visions to animate the future of right-wing politics. Populist nationalism, which I think has a much better chance at success, and some version of integralism. Now, statism, just to finish this off, statism, you know, my own view that I think I hinted at in the talk is that, you know, accommodations to massive technological change are going to be driving future political formations as much as abstract uh, ideological considerations. So China is a model of statism, right? And the Chinese model of statism, for all of its problems and for all of its very evident uh, abuses of uh, values that I think many of us would would hold dear and would not want to sacrifice, appears to be, at the moment, a more effective means for harnessing these incredibly disruptive social technologies which are only becoming more powerful. And um, attempts to engineer American forms of statism, I suspect, which are not at all inconceivable, but will look much more like a uh, accommodations to t- a powerful state to administer uh, corporate technologies and much less like uh, the integralist vision that's focused on reorienting society to the higher good. It has a different uh, valence for Protestants, I think, than it does for Catholics. Protestantism being a you know, explicitly non-hierarchical, anti-hierarchical in the sense that Catholic hierarchy is oriented. It's more a matter of personal (laughs) conscience and of legislation over certain sort of key culture war issues like abortion, for instance, right? But that the, when Pence says that he's a Christian, first, I don't think that connotes like any desire to seize this ship of power of the state and like forget about proceduralism, right? Because that's the other thing about integralism is that like the alt-right, like a lot of anti-liberal movements, it's contemptuous of liberal proceduralism, which is weak, which the demos is like, what do these people know? Why? And you know, what gets done? Nothing gets done. So uh, that's a more aligned, I think, with Catholic political traditions. And to the side, America First and Nick Fuentes and the Groypers, there's a heavily Catholic strain to that. I don't know if that's something that you've thought, but Fuentes himself is Catholic. One of their intellectual heroes is E. Michael Jones, if you're familiar with him. I'm not, no. Yeah, um, ultra conservative Catholic. I think that with like the Fuentes types, which you have with them, it's much more of a set of attitudes and gestures than a political program. You know, Vermeule has a political program, or a, Vermeule has a theory of politics, a very sophisticated theory of politics. I think he's quite wrong on some things, uh, like, very wrong, you know, but, um, but it's an attempt to think these things through and to have some sort of coherence. Fuentes is like, throw it all against the wall and see what sticks. You know, like anything that's anti-liberal and right-wing is good enough, right? So this opposition between nationalism and statism that I'm describing, they don't see it as a problem. They don't think that hard about it. 
They're not that bright. Uh, you know, Fuentes is like, there are, make no mistake, there are intelligent people in the alt-right. Um, Spencer is not an idiot. Um, now he's more of a popularizer of ideas than he is a theoretician or something, but you know, the reason why like, these, the, these movements present problems is because they're not all idiots. Uh, Fuentes is an idiot, I think. I mean, I don't think he's, he, I don't, he's not like a guy who's worried about these contradictions or anything. He's a charismatic figure. And politics needs charismatic figures. Sometimes, you know, they will get a lot more done than the, than the thinkers will. Um, and so I think these, like, it doesn't matter that it's incoherent. What ma the gesture is what matters. You know, the style is what matters. The oppositional posture is what matters.